Again, my name is Dean Rogers, and uh, I think I've met probably over half of you, I think, to this point. Um, first time meeting me? Okay, <laughs> nice to meet you all. Thank you for coming. Much appreciated. Um, my focus is today is, again, we've grown from one school originally. Uh, I started basically from scratch, uh, raised a little bit of capital and built a school, and have grown that now to 10 schools and uh, several thousand students. and. Uh, about 110 employees now total on the school's business. We have other businesses, but the school's business was the first one that I started. All right, so the quick stuff, I'm only, like I said, a few of you showed up a little bit later, but um, only gonna try and do this in about 25 minutes, so we have time to focus on Q&A and market data and market information. Uh, most people like you have your own schools or are interested in doing so, have questions that you'd like answered rather than just watching a presentation. I'd rather focus, if I can, about half the time on a answering your questions. Okay, so getting nearly everything wrong in the beginning kind of for me consisted of quite a few things. Um, overspend on advertising, so you look at what all the other schools are doing and you tend to just go, okay, so we need to be in Keiko to Manabu. You know, if we get to a few school size, maybe we need to be on the Yamanote line here in Tokyo, for example. Um, mimicking and copying rather than innovating and finding cost-effective ways, especially in the beginning when you're really low on cash. Um, flyering has become an extremely effective way for us that we still use to this day, even though we do more marketing now because we have a much bigger budget for being able to market uh, than we did when we started with one school. But flyering is a very, very effective way, especially if you're a foreigner doing that flyering. Uh, people will stop and talk to you. Um, it's a very easy way to, inter if you're going after kids, you'll meet moms. Uh, you get a very good and easy, inexpensive chance. It's just your time. So rather than sitting there and trying to figure out how to gain more customers, a uh, very important step to go out there and actually, there's also a certain satisfaction getting out there and doing something. And it's kind of a, it adds up over time. More and more people have accumulated your flyers. We've had students come after two and a half years. They received a flyer and it sat on their dresser and they kept men meaning to call. And uh, those have still, still happened today, actually. So it's one of those you're investing in long term. And it's very inexpensive. You know, 10,000 flyers uh, will cost you Ichimayen, Ichimangosen, that kind of range. And you can reach a lot of people that way. A lot of people are looking for the passive marketing way, but as a new school or a small school, you need to get out there. We advertised. Oh, yeah. We had no customers. We spent a lot of money advertising. I would strongly advise against it, unless you have a small local publication that's relatively inexpensive that you think will get you results. And even then, I wouldn't sign any long-term contracts. I would, I would kind of, and it does take time for marketing to kind of take its effect. So decide on your strategy and, and consistently move forward with it. But this is a no-brainer. I mean, Japan, why do you see people doing this all the time? Because it works, right? Um, we had a school plus an office. Big mistake, didn't need an office. We should have been working in the booth exactly where I ended up being about nine months after running out of money and uh, actually teaching a lot. Uh, spending money in all the wrong ways, and there's a long, long list, which we'll go in the Q&A. We can go into that a little bit more. Um, trying to compete rather than succeed. I think this is an important lesson for a lot of new entrepreneurs. Um, most people think you have to go out there and beat the competition. It's kind of, we go back to sports and we're raised in a very competitive environment. You know, you're on, your team has to beat the other team. And in reality, especially in education, I think focusing on what is your brand and what is it that you're trying to achieve uh, for your business, having a good understanding of what you want to achieve in your business is also very important. Um, partnership start. Anybody in a partnership? You too? For now. For now? <laughs> Anybody else in a partnership? It's the hardest road. Quite different. You will find out every weakness everything that you do and don't like, you know, someone's working on the side, not someone else is putting in more time, a sense of dissatisfaction from that. I work smarter, you work harder. There's a lot of dif difficulties and it'll be a real test. I would say the divorce rate, and he's heard me say this before, for partnerships is gr much, much higher than the divorce rate on marriage. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's a tough, not to give you a negative road, but for example, you know, we've got Anthony over here. His, his bosses, um, Peter and Eric, are very, very successful partnership. Uh, Gaijin Pot, which most of you guys know. Um, Peter and Eric are also good friends of mine. I served on their board for about eight, four, five years. Sorry, and uh, the, the beginning of the presentation was welcome to hell, and yes. now they get a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is it, it will test you in ways that even a relationship never will 
because there's money, there's people that need to be paid, there's oftentimes as you're struggling, there's an obligation to not just pay them, you're maybe borrowing money, who's going to take ownership and responsibility for that? Um, if one person's a foreigner and the other person's Japanese, the Gaijin Megi doesn't really stand for much at this point, They're the actual uh, name. Uh, you need someone who's got a Japanese Megi in Japanese history. Um, again, you know, there's a lot of challenges that you'll find during the course of the, in the development in the first couple of years as the business itself is very unstable. You don't have consistent revenue. It takes about three years for most businesses to get some kind of consistency in their business. And that's a very long period of time for most people to struggle. Most people, it's much easier to fall back to your consistent job where you make a consistent paycheck, where you can take care of your family. And, uh, and most entrepreneurs struggle very, very hard in the first three to five years. It's very common. You have to realize that's the level of commitment at a minimum that you need to get off the ground. Um, managing, not leading. I was in managing people all the time, telling people what to do. You should go this, you should go there. And in a business like ours, I should have been leading in the language booth, teaching, a lot more than I was, which uh, a little bit of my own arrogance, I would say, probably, since I came more out of a business background and uh, thought I knew a lot more than I really did. Uh, copying, not innovating. I covered that a little bit before. Uh, looking to copy what other people were doing, whether it was a marketing, whether it was strategy, uh, rather than innovating a strategy that worked for us and the team that we built. Uh, insufficient preparation, honestly speaking, everybody has that problem. There's never enough preparation you can do, and half of your preparation will probably be wrong. That's just the reality. It's a, it's a moving target. The success in your business and what's going to actually work is a constantly moving target. Uh, arrogance and overconfidence, still struggle with that one, but uh, I'm a little bit better after being humbled quite deeply. Come on in. We raised about a million dollars total to start the business, and it took less than a year to spend every penny of it, and then some. So made a lot of mistakes with that. And you'll hear this quite common with entrepreneurs. Someone raises $10 million to start their business. It never lasts more than about two years. Most people, you, you raise $100 million. I mean, look at the IP of the IT bubble. It was filled with companies that raised hundreds of millions of dollars, which they burned through in two to three years. Because the impetus from investors is that you need to develop the business quickly. And so you spend money quite aggressively. And uh, it's, people who are doing it the second or the third time are usually a little bit smarter about it. But first time, serious entrepreneurs that actually raise money, uh, it's quite challenging. Um, one of my personal philosophies is trust but always verify. So even when I do business or have a financial arrangement with my own parents or my brother, I always have a contract. And it's not a, ma it's not a matter of trust. It just comes down to, you, I need verification. I think everybody should have verification. It solidifies what was agreed upon by both parties without any leeway for mistaking. Oh, no, I thought you said this, or I thought you said that. It's very clear. And so many people, no, 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 we trust, and especially partnerships. No, let's trust. Put it into paper. Document it. Uh, even a dissolution agreement, in the case where we can no longer work together, how would we go about the dilution? or dissolution of the business. Very important. I mean, it's reality. Things I did wrong as we grew. Hired quickly, fired slowly. If you get an idea, it's the opposite of that, is the correct way to build a business. Sounds very harsh. I'll go into it a little bit later if you want a little bit more. Uh, focused on problems, not opportunities. Constantly trying to fix things rather than focusing Looking to resolve problems wherever possible, but really trying to focus on the opportunities we had because that's where the business was going to grow. The business is not going to grow by focusing on problems. Uh, but you do need to solve critical problems. There's no question. You can't avoid those. But you do need to constantly focus that any amount of extra energy you may have on the opportunities that you have to grow the business. Was easily distracted by all the wrong people. Using the old 80-20 rule, quite commonly quoted, or the 20-80 rule. Um, this one can be applied in a lot of different ways in business, but uh, in my case, and still to this day, we struggle with this periodically, is uh, how many of you guys have employees? Okay, more than five? Yeah, okay. As you get up five, 10, 20 employees, you get a point in time where oftentimes the people that are performing the lowest tend to complain the most. The people who are struggling to perform, to, to actually produce results along the lines that you hired them for. 
So their job is to teach and provide good lessons, or they're a salesperson who's supposed to be producing results. The people who are producing great results don't tend to complain as much. And you end up with the people that are the lowest performers taking up 70, 80 percent of your time because you're constantly trying to meet their needs. And it's so easy to get distracted in that way, constantly. And the other old 80-20 is that you know 20 percent of your people will create 80 percent of your results and 80 percent of your problems will probably come from 20 percent of your people. And it's a very, very consistent statistic, if you, r roughly that area. Is it basically the bulk of the people um, aren't, don't need much maintenance. They don't need much management. They're good people who are on, on course for where they want to go. It's a handful of people who are usually the underperformers that take up an enormous amount of your time, enormous amount of your time, and your managers. And teaching your managers when you have managers, actually, this is something you have to foc focus on and be aware. Are you spending all your time working on problems? And if that's the case, you're managing, not leading. Customer's second philosophy, our company's philosophy, and our quoted in our, if you look in our brochures, I brought a few with us. Uh, even in our student brochures, our company um, slogan is customer second. Okakusama niban. It's quite different than okakusama wa kamisama. So the Japanese customer is king, customer is god. Um, in our case, it's very much focused on because we're a service company. And I had that idea and that concept, but I think it was oftentimes misunderstood. And this ended up being something that actually weighed us down in the first couple of years. Um, I didn't communicate clearly enough and understand myself, I think, deeply enough what that truly meant to us, what Customer Second was truly about. And in our case, it was about finding the right people, getting the right people on board, making sure they're happy. But not just happy. You have that 20% that take up 80% of your time. When I'm trying to satisfy those people's needs, those are the people that are the wrong people in our business that we need to move out and we need to get the right people on board and replace them with. And uh, oftentimes those people can highlight things for you that are wrong in your business and you do need to listen. You need, do need to understand what's happening in your business because oftentimes those complainers do have, there's a kernel of truth in most complaints. Recognizing what it is, but rather than that person saying, let's work on some solutions together, I have some ideas on how to improve things, they're the kind of person who, like if you've ever had, any of you have customers, the Japanese like claim, this, the, you have certain customers who are claimers. They never stop complaining. There's always a complaint. And you have employees who are the same way. And those kind of people you do not need in your business. They will, a complainer, one student complainer can take up hundreds of hours of your employees' time. I've fired, quote unquote, quite a few students over the years, thrown them out of our school, and just said, I'm sorry, quite a little bit more politely than that, but quietly said, you know, I'm sorry, I don't think we can address the needs that you have. And I'd like to provide you with a full refund for your remaining lessons since you're not satisfied. No, 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 I'll stay. No, it's okay. We've already refunded your money. And uh, I think that proactive way, my employees, the response from them is just utter relief. And there's a commitment and a recommitment to the company and to our management because we were willing to sacrifice some revenue in order to make sure that they had a great place to work with the right customers who appreciated the quality of the lessons that they were providing. And the few things I got right, come on in. <coughs> Raising enough capital to survive on my own, you need money. You know, especially if it's your first business, it'll suck a lot of money out of you. There's preparation for that, it may be financing, it may be investors, uh, cutting your lifestyle down to the absolute minimum, probably for an unforeseen amount of time. That's the reality with most entrepreneurs. If I, I get approached all the time by investors looking for capital, looking for investment into the schools or into their curriculum project. And you know, my first thing I'm evaluating is what kind of car are they driving? What kind of house are they living in? Are they realistic in terms? Are they looking for me to pay for their lifestyle? Or are they really looking to successfully build a business from scratch? And it takes a tremendous amount of sacrifice. Well, you know, I've, I've done quite well up to now. I'm not going to lower my quality of life to this low level. Then you're probably not ready to be an entrepreneur, to be honest. It's usually a road filled with quite a bit of bumpiness and a fair bit of unexpected sacrifice. And by preparing for that, and in my case, the way I was fortunate enough to actually do is I was taught that from a very young age. I have a lot of entrepreneurial friends. And so I moved into a 25 square meter apartment, about five minutes walk from my office. And I came over as an expat working for a big software company, lived in Hiro here in Tokyo, and uh, downsized everything to absolute Nothing. And it ended up saving me because I couldn't afford to take a salary for four years when we first started. 
Um, you know, part of it is because of those mistakes and losing our investors' money. There's a certain amount of guilt, I would say, I felt in that. And at the same time, now that we've grown and, you know, I happily take a salary, so please don't worry. But uh, I think that, that probably was one of the things that saved me, is I was fairly good at raising capital. So I haven't gone back and raised it since. We survived on our own. Learning to lead rather than manage. I discussed a little bit earlier, and there's a slide following this that I'll kind of discuss what that means. Finding key weakness, weaknesses and the right pe people quickly. So what are the weaknesses that were undermining our desire to grow the business? We had a lot of them. And then finding the right people. I have a picture later on that I'll show you of some of the people that have really made our success possible. Because you know, even at our size, I do probably less than 1% of the work. It's really uh, the commitment of the people to the business. And from my point of view, it's actually that customer second philosophy of, is being the, the living, breathing person who really represents it, uh, making sacrifices for the team all the time. Very important. Understanding where I wanted to take the business. This is what we were talking about earlier, goals. And goals are nothing but dreams without an absolute deadline. Your dream will continue to be a dream unless you set a deadline. At what point in time, how much money am I going to need? What is my commitment? Setting it out there three years, five years, one year, and preparing yourself for that, it becomes a reality. Otherwise, most goals re remain a dream for most people. There's a good book that's built around that idea that's worth reading. It's, I think it's something like a dream is, or goal is nothing but a dream without a deadline or something like that. It's pretty close to what I quoted you. Um, getting the right people on the bus. This actually, I think, comes from Tim Collins. I think he's a great, good to great book. He quotes this quite a lot. Um, getting the right people on the bus means getting the wrong people off. <laughs> and I do a full presentation at all of our management retreats. We, we do several management retreats every year. We have a junior management retreat where we do training. Uh, senior management retreat where we talk about the direction of the company. We have a town hall meeting where they just bombard me with and our board of directors with questions for about four hours and we all answer everything honestly. Well, in five years, if, if we get bought out or go public, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do with your money? What, what's your goal? And in my case, I can sit back and answer them honestly about those things. And getting the right people on the bus for us, I talk that one of the main things I present on is judgment. I think most of us grew up in a more than half grew up in a Western society and were taught never judge people. I teach a class to, in our management training seminars about your job is to judge people. Get used to it. It's a manager's, if you're not judging, somebody has to judge whether or not someone is doing a good job or not. And when you're the owner, it's your job to judge. You need to judge fairly, but you need to judge. Is this person right for this team? Is this person right for the company? You have to be willing and able to judge people. And it's something that's not as intuitive as you would think. Because we're constantly talking, oh, don't judge people. It's not the Christian or it's not the Buddhist way of doing things. The reality is, as a business owner or as a senior manager or as an executive in a business, your job is to judge people. And it comes down to you, especially if you're an owner. And when it comes to recruiting and managing top managers to run your business, you have to constantly judge them. You judge them fairly, you encourage them, you motivate them, but you're constantly judging. Leadership versus management, what's the difference? I like this one. Got to quote Drucker at least once when we're talking about doing business, right? He's got a lot of good quotes. Management is doing things right. Uh, leadership is doing the right things. Being able to make that choice, make the judgment, make the call. Seeing the situation, not just seeing what you have to do. Managers see what they have to do. A leader sees what they need to do and what they need to do to change the business or how to grow it. It's a very different mentality. This one's good. It's from Warren Bennis. It's old, 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 old. I mean, we're talking 25 years ago. Management versus leadership, what's the difference? And these are the, some of the things that have really been a savior for us as we've started to become more successful as a company, is trying to transition our company and our people and our managers from this side of the board over to here. So manager administers. They look after things. They take care of things. They keep the status quo more, than, more often than not. A leader innovates, finds new ways to change things in a good way, challenges the existing way of doing things. Manager is generally a copy. They're looking to mimic what their boss did before them. Right? Oh, this is what I'm supposed to do, so I just copy what other people have done before me. A, a good manager leader is a, someone who's original. 
They're able to approach things, see things differently, find new ways to make them better. Manager tends to maintain things. A lot of your average manager thinks their job is to maintain things and relatively keep things from getting out of hand or having difficulties. Whereas in reality, someone, their job is to develop, to develop the people below them, to develop the curriculum, to develop the system, to improve the business, to not just look to keep things the same. Because if you keep things the same, guess what? They will stay the same, at best. More than likely, it'll start to degrade. I mean, society, customer needs, they don't stay the same. You have to keep innovating and changing. And that's one thing I think as a company, we've got better and better and has started to really help us to succeed and, and got us off that one school, the second school, the third school, the fifth school, the eighth school, the tenth school. Manager focuses on systems and structure, right? So focusing on system and structure is very, especially as a new manager, okay, there's ways of doing things. I have to memorize all these ways to do things. Right? The system, the structure, the way my job is supposed to be. They focus really hard on that versus the leader focuses on the people. Right? You have job responsibilities, that's one thing, but a great leader someone who really builds the business successfully and gets more involved and usually gets promoted and moves on is someone who focuses on the people because the success of the people who work for you is usually the sum of your success as a manager. But most people are very focused on what they have to do rather than the people below them and a great manager earns real trust from his people by focusing on them rather than themselves. And that's the kind of die-hard trust where people will come to bat for you. And, and bad problems never become really bad. And the best example for me for that would be probably the, the day after the earthquake here. So we've got about 60, 65 people here in Tokyo that work at our schools. And, uh, the next day, our executive team met. We decided to bring, open the school the next day. It's a pretty big call. A lot of schools shut down for weeks. Said, no, oh, please, employees, take time off. This is a hard circumstances. Anybody have an idea why we decided to open up our school and everybody come back to work? Any clue? Any idea? Your new salary. Huh? Your salary. My salary? <laughs> Paying salary? <laughs> What, what were most people doing? Sitting at home in fear and panic and getting depressed. And, getting depressed. and you know, the, the three people who really complained about that are no longer with us. And we didn't fire them. They took themselves out of the business. They didn't understand. And we talked quite openly. This is a time where you're all starting to build up a panic. Nobody left. We had two people who actually their parents took them away. One of them was my PA at the time, uh, secretary. And uh, she, three days later, called me and said, I'm on an airplane back, and I told my husband and my mom, if they want to follow me, they're welcome. But everybody else is at work. And the following month in April, we've had, we had the biggest sales month we've ever had. Our salespeople hit the streets. Customers were sitting around doing nothing. They introduced their friends. They were all surprised that we were open the two days later and that there wasn't a sense of panic. They felt safe in our schools because people weren't freaked out about it. I gathered a lot of information. I was working with actually G Plus Media and Gaijin Pont, Anthony's company, um, had a lot of connections into, um, he's the guy recording the video, um, had a lot of connections into some of the military um, complex, it was the nuclear departments. I sat in a lot, of, on a lot of conference calls, assembled that. I have family who are engineers and did a lot in physics. Gathered the information, said these are the risks at hand. Um, they're fairly minimal from what I can tell. And uh, yeah, it's, it was different. And people really felt secure and safe and glad that they were at work. Whereas other people were panicked and, you know, schools were losing 40% of their employees. The reason was we sat down as a management team and said, you know, what's going on with our people? What's it going on in their minds? There's a sense of panic. How do we solve that? We bring that together. We find information. I shared some of those calls, recorded some of those calls and shared them with our staff. And the weird thing is students responded like you wouldn't believe. And we had record sales in April. It was quite amazing to go through that. Um, the manager relies on control. The leader inspires trust. Again, that's a very big difference. Your f a lot of managers make the mistake, I'm the manager, you have to respect me. It's absolutely the opposite. You're a manager, you have to earn the respect and earn the trust of the people who work for you. And you do that by working for them tirelessly. What is it that they need? What is it that they need to succeed? And when you have the wrong person on the bus, not AM, they need trying to help the wrong person, getting the wrong person off quickly. 
And that's usually the hardest one to see. And then manager accepts the status quo, and a manager has a short range view, versus the leader has a long range perspective, and the leader challenges the status quo. Right? This is from Noel Bradshaw, our COO, at our senior management retreat two weeks ago. Defining leadership, there's a couple of good quotes, just throwing out there for you. Nothing particular I'm gonna talk about, but I tend to like most of them. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. If your actions inspires others to dream, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. This is John Quincy Adams. A leader is a dealer in hope. It's very true. Most people who are especially employees still struggling to figure out what they wanna do with their life or they may have goals, a leader provides hope for them, a goal for where they're gonna go in their life. And you are definitely a dealer in hope. And it's taking that hope into reality, step by step, systematically, getting the right people on, getting the right people off. You systematically achieve more and more success in your business, which is success for your people. They get more pay, they get recognition from being in a successful business, they get pride in the quality of the work. Leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. Easier said than done. It's great to have a great vision, but actually converting that into reality is very difficult for a single person, which is why it's so important to have the right people on. The better you, once you start getting more and more really good people on board, it's not reliant on you alone. Getting those right people on board, getting them really passionate about your vision, helping shape the vision will allow you to really scale to a different level. And the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. I like that one, that's Eisenhower, right? Great example, leading in World War II. You think everybody wants to go jump across a minefield? They want to do it. They're passionate about and believe in what they were doing, right? Every war is that way. Great, great armies win, especially the smaller army that defeats the larger army, because they believe more. And it's a great book. A little bit of religious overtones in, in it, not too heavily, but a little bit, but the concepts in it are, are quite good. Uh, one of my maybe top five, top ten on, on business leadership. And definitely one of the books that helped shape my philosophy that kind of got us from that failing cycle into a little bit more of a winning cycle. And uh, five phases he puts in this book. Uh, the l first phase of when you're actually a leader is you're just learning, to be quite honest. You don't really know what your, how your leadership skills are going to be interpreted by the people that work for you. You're still learning what works, what doesn't work. You start performing, still a relatively low level of leadership. Then you actually start leading people. You're directly in front of people. You're charging them. You're motivating them. They're achieving specific things. Next level would be developing leaders, people who actually lead the business. It's no longer dependent on you. I would say I'm probably somewhere around here. I don't have to run the day-to-day -day business of my operations anymore. Um, periodically, I may jump in here and jump back, but uh, develop, sometimes I'm way back here. <laughs> I think you're kind of all over the board. Uh, developing leaders who develop leaders. So when you've got leaders who are now passionate about really developing the people below them, not just as employees, but as people who can run the business or run that division or run that curriculum division or run that portion of your business. And that's honestly, as a business owner, is where you achieve true freedom and enjoyment. Otherwise, you are absolutely trapped by your business. Uh, being a business owner, you t most business owners tend to worry more, work more, and get paid less than people. If you want good money, go work for a company that pays well. You, got, you can leave work regular hours. You don't necessarily have to take your work home with you all that much. Once you open up your own business, it never leaves your mind. And it, the only time it's really stopped started to leave my mind periodically, go on holiday, is once you have great leaders who really run the business and it's not dependent on you anymore. All right. So, question, which are you now? And final conclusion. Um, for me, leadership, I think for all of us, is a journey filled with mistakes. And I, this is one of my favorite quotes on my desktop, on my computer. If you're not falling down, f failing now and again, it's a sign you are doing nothing innovative. You know, some of you, oh, we're really successful. We haven't had any major mistakes over the last three years. Well, sounds like you're not doing much very innovative. There's usually a long slew. There's more failures usually than successes, especially if you're really trying to be highly innovative 
you're trying new things, you're challenging new things. But at the same time, you have to maintain certain successes because you have bills to pay. You can't just go innovate willy-nilly. You have a consistent business that you need to grow, but at the same time, you need to innovate. Managers need to be leaders more than just managers. We talked about that a little bit. No single way to be a leader. So I've given you some of my ideas. You have to find your own style, your own way of becoming a leader. I think you'll, you will find if you research and you talk to people, there are some consistent themes that without question work. One for me is absolutely you have to learn how to judge people, um, be willing to judge people. And that's probably one of the hardest things for most people. I'll say that again and again because it's so true because we, we actually do seminars and training on this and it's still so difficult for people. They, oftentimes they take the manager approach to it which is I'm going to tell this person you're not doing a good job versus actually working and developing them, seeing if they're able to adapt or if the role is appropriate for them and if it's not. I mean that's the difference between a manager and a leader, telling versus learning, educating, motivating, seeing someone change and grow and taking deep satisfaction from seeing someone develop and grow, not seeing them as a potential competitor who could take your job. A smart manager is someone who's trying to develop someone to take over their job so that they can move up. Uh, you have to find your own leadership niche. Again, if you keep doing what you've always done, then you will keep being what you've always been. That's another one of my favorite simple kind of rhyming style sentences. But, you know, constantly doing the same thing, guess what? You're going to keep doing the same thing and the market's going to move on without you. And our industry is filled with a lot of those kind of companies that are struggling to survive more and more. There's a lot of momentum there with a lot of big players, but the level of innovation, you know, we hired recently a uh, secretary from one of uh, the major language schools, and not kidding, the, the CEO to f hundreds of schools still faxes out messages that go out to each school, not even email. There's no online scheduling system. Most of the major schools are still like this. And we're, we're not talking like, you know, cutting edge technology here to just communicate more efficiently and more effectively. Um, watch, listen, learn, act, execute. And these are my simple ones. If any of them work for you, please feel free to take them and make them your own. Trust me, most of them are not original. I have taken and adapted a few. This one is a version of something Warren Buffett said that I kind of adjusted my own way. This is another one from a fallen business hero, David Sokol, who used to work for Warren Buffett, but got fired because of forerunning. Um, was, if you guys know who Warren Buffett is. But I like it quite a lot, trust but verify. Um, my personal philosophy is I only work with people and build relationships with people in my personal life as well, who I first trust, I admire, I respect, and I like. I'll accept three out of those four, but if they're not there, those are people that you shouldn't be working with. They may work great with somebody else, but they obviously don't mesh well with you. And you need to build a team that works for you, not look to adjust to everybody else around you. You've got enough responsibility already in trying to grow your business. You need to adjust to those people, be a reasonable person, but at the same time, if you lack trust, you lack admiration, you can't respect the person and honestly quite dislike them, they need to find a, a different bus to ride on because your bus is obviously not a good match for them. If you'd like to get an email of this or any of the market data, which I do have a whole bunch of information from Yano Research, Medi, the Foreign Language Institute, sales statistics and data. I brought a lot of this information that's all up to date in the last couple of months. I'd be more than happy to send it off to you guys uh, to make your own interpretation of where you think the market is going. Gives you a good idea. But if anybody wants a business card, I think I have probably enough. Surprise, pretty good showing today. Thank you. Anybody wants to suggest? Thank you.